My coworker is obsessed with taking credit for my work. So I started giving her exactly what she wanted. So, I work with this woman. Let's call her Megan, and let me tell you. She's the type of coworker who can really drive you up the wall. You know the type. She's got this uncanny ability to swoop in on anything you do. Take just enough credit for it. And make it look like she's the one pulling all the weight. At first, I thought maybe I was imagining things. You know, just seeing things through my own lens. But over time, it became obvious. Megan's not just sneaky. She's built her whole reputation on taking other people's work and passing it off as her own. I've always been a keep your head down kind of guy. I don't love confrontation, and I don't need the spotlight. I figured if I just stayed in my lane, put my energy into my own projects, things would work themselves out. But somehow, Megan seemed to have this sixth sense for sniffing out anyone else's work. And if you so much as said something halfway intelligent in a meeting, she'd parrot it back a minute later in her loud, assured voice, like it was her brainchild all along. Honestly, it's a skill. Really, the way she's able to walk that fine line between working collaboratively and straight up theft. This went on for a while, months. In fact, at first, I let it slide. I told myself that as long as I was doing a good job. It didn't matter who took credit, but it started to chip away at me. Little by little, it wasn't just an isolated incident here or there. It was this constant undercurrent in our department. This feeling that my efforts were getting swallowed up by her need to be in the spotlight. Things hit a new level. Though, when Megan started escalating, it was no longer just ideas here and there. Now, it was whole presentations, reports, entire projects. I'd spend hours, sometimes days, on a detailed analysis, only for her to march into the boss's office with my work and talk through it like she'd spent the night burning the midnight oil. The kicker? Management actually seemed to buy it. They ate it up. Every time, I'd sit there, watching her get pats on the back, feeling like some kind of invisible assistant instead of a real team member. And the crazy thing? No one seemed to notice. I guess when you're not one to make a fuss, people start assuming you're okay with it. I'd never been one to stand up and shout about my own work. But it was getting harder and harder to sit there, watching Megan smile while my efforts got casually brushed aside. I think my frustration finally reached a tipping point after our last big project. I'd spent hours combing through data, pulling together insights, making the whole thing look polished and professional. And then, in what felt like the grand finale of all her previous stunts, Megan waltzed into the boardroom, presented my report, and accepted the credit without a word of acknowledgement. Watching her take that bow, seeing the boss nodding with approval, it was like the last straw. I realized then that something had to change. I wasn't exactly sure how to go about it yet. Confrontation wasn't my style, and it didn't seem like the boss would believe me if I tried to explain what was going on. But I knew one thing for sure, I couldn't keep letting this happen. Megan might have thought she could keep taking my work without consequences. But she had no idea who she was dealing with. That's when the idea first started forming. If Megan wanted my work, fine, I'd give her work, just not in the way she expected. The breaking point came after one of our biggest projects of the year. We'd been working on a comprehensive market analysis that required hours of deep research. Sifting through data, finding trends, and putting it all together in a way that told a clear story. It wasn't just a run-of-the-mill project. Either, this was one of those high-profile assignments where all eyes were on us. Where doing a good job could really make an impact on the team and even my career. I poured everything into it. And by the time I was done, I was actually proud of what I'd created. It was solid work, something I felt deserved a little recognition. The day before the presentation, I finished everything up, polished the slides, and double-checked all the data. I figured we'd present it together, or at least that I'd get to walk the team through my findings. But, of course, Megan had other plans. The next morning, I walk into the office, and she's already scheduled a private meeting with the boss to go over, our, project. And by, our, I mean the project I'd done 95% of the work on. I could feel the anger building up, that hot, burning sensation in the pit of my stomach. But I told myself to stay calm. Maybe this time, she'd at least acknowledge my role. But nope, she walked right into that meeting, laptop in hand, slides open, and laid out every detail of the project as though she'd crafted it herself. She didn't just stop at presenting my work, she embellished it. Going on and on about her supposed insights and observations, as if she'd been the mastermind behind every data point. And the worst part? The boss was lapping it up, nodding, jotting down notes, and actually looking impressed. I sat outside the meeting room, pretending to work while I waited for my turn to join. When they finally called me in, Megan had already finished her summary. The boss glanced over, gave me a brief, good job on the team effort, and then moved right along to the next item on his agenda. That was it. No chance to speak. No opportunity to present my own work. Just a throwaway compliment on a project that I had led from start to finish. I walked out of that room feeling completely deflated. It was as if all the hours I'd poured into that project. All the late nights, all the extra effort, had been for nothing. I kept my cool, smiled, and nodded, but inside, I was fuming. It was more than just frustration, it was this deep sense of betrayal. Like I'd been robbed of something that was rightfully mine, and all because Megan knew how to play the game. On the way home that night, 
I thought about the pattern that had played out time and time again. I kept hoping that management would see what she was doing, that maybe the quality of my work would speak for itself. But the truth was, in this office, the one who spoke the loudest got the credit. And Megan was loud. I was done being invisible. Done watching her stand in the spotlight while I was left in the shadows. That night, I finally accepted something I'd been trying to ignore. If I didn't stand up for myself, no one else was going to do it for me. Megan wanted to keep taking credit for my work. To keep basking in the praise that should have come my way. Fine, I'd give her exactly what she wanted. But this time, I'd do it on my terms. It was then that the plan began to take shape. If she wanted to present my work as her own, I'd make sure she had something unforgettable to present. Something that looked impressive but would unravel in her hands the moment she tried to explain it. Once I got past my initial frustration, the plan started coming together. It was like the light bulb clicked on, and I finally saw the path forward. If Megan was going to keep swiping my work, I'd just make sure the next thing she swiped wasn't what she thought it was. I wasn't going to make it obvious, of course. No, this had to be something that looked impressive, something elaborate, detailed, filled with so much professional lingo that it would be impossible to tell at first glance that it was. In fact, a complete pile of nonsense. I spent the next day brainstorming, thinking up every buzzword and meaningless corporate phrase I could muster. The goal was to make this presentation look like a revolutionary new process while being absolute gibberish at its core. After a lot of consideration, I landed on a catchy name that sounded impressive but didn't mean anything at all. Optimal Revenue Integration Strategy. Oris for short. I'd even throw in a few nicknames here and there to really sell it, the Oris Method. Integrated Oris Solutions. The trick was to make it look like it came straight out of a high-level consultancy workshop. Over the next few days, I poured everything into this project. I built out a 25-slide presentation, each slide more impressive looking than the last. I added flowcharts, tables, bullet points, and even a few graphs that looked sophisticated but represented absolutely nothing. My favorite slide was one that was all arrows, boxes, and phrases like, synergize strategic revenue, and monetize optimal profit streams. Designed to look so complex that anyone unfamiliar would assume it had real depth. I laughed to myself every time I added a new line of jargon. Phrases like, revenue synergy optimization, and cross-functional streamline leverage, you know. Words that sound just fancy enough that nobody would dare question them in a meeting for fear of looking out of the loop. I knew exactly how Megan's mind worked. She'd see the buzzwords. The big numbers. And she'd latch on without actually understanding any of it. The best part? I added a few slides on supposed case studies of Aura's implementation. I took random snippets from previous reports. Modified them just enough to look like examples of Aura's in action. And called them preliminary success metrics. I knew Megan would love these. Probably point them out as proof of ORIS's brilliance. But if anyone asked for the specifics, she'd be absolutely stumped. Once the whole thing was ready, I made it look as polished as possible. Every title, every bullet point, meticulously crafted to scream, innovative strategy. I included an entire, summary, slide, which was really just a collection of impressive phrases like, revenue realization matrix, and, optimized channel alignment. I even added a section titled, future directions in Aurus, because nothing says, cutting edge, like hinting at a mystery strategy that's constantly evolving. With the presentation complete, all I had to do was set the bait. Megan loved nothing more than, stumbling upon, ideas she could call her own. And I had a pretty good idea of her schedule. I'd make sure Oris was, accidentally, left open on my computer during lunch. Fully visible to anyone who passed by. If I'd learned one thing in my time working with her, it was that Megan couldn't resist taking what wasn't hers. Especially if it was something that looked impressive. The morning I set the trap, I could hardly contain my excitement. I felt this strange mix of nervousness and anticipation. Like I was gearing up for the final play in a long game. I knew there was a chance she might smell a rat. But I also knew Megan's greed for the spotlight was too strong. She'd see Oris and want it for herself. Just before heading out for lunch. I opened up the presentation. Making sure the title slide was front and center. Optimal revenue integration strategy. It read. In bold. Striking letters. I threw in a few. Version 1.3. Labels in the corners. Just to make it look like something I'd been working on for a while. Then I walked out. Feeling like I just set the perfect mousetrap. It took every bit of restraint I had not to look back or linger. Not to check if she'd seen it. All I could do was hope that, true to form, Megan would swoop in and take the bait. Completely unaware of the mess she was about to walk into. Leaving that presentation open on my desktop felt like a final, calculated risk. And, honestly, it was a thrill. I spent the whole lunch hour resisting the urge to rush back and see if she'd taken the bait. I even took a longer route back, giving her extra time to, discover, my latest, totally fictitious project. By the time I returned to my desk. The first thing I noticed was that the document was closed. That's when I knew she'd found it. Megan couldn't resist something that looked half-finished and important. Just lying there, I settled in, casually checking emails and pretending like I didn't notice anything unusual. But inside, I was practically buzzing. I felt a strange mix of nerves and satisfaction. I'd put in the effort, crafted a perfect piece of corporate nonsense, 
And now all I had to do was wait for Megan to do what she did best, claim my work. Sure enough, later that afternoon, Megan was all smiles, strutting around the office like she had some big news. I didn't even have to overhear her directly to know what was happening, she was practically radiating excitement. The same way she always did when she had a plan to showcase her work. When I saw her schedule a meeting with the boss for later that week, I knew she was ready to unveil Oris, probably expecting it to be her ticket to some new praise or promotion. That evening, I made a point of leaving work right on time, which wasn't like me. Normally, I'd stick around, catching up on loose ends or fine-tuning a report. But today, I wanted to make sure Megan had no interruptions. As I left, I walked past her desk, gave her a nod, and casually mentioned that I had a few projects wrapping up soon. She just smiled, and I could practically see the wheels turning in her mind, planning her big presentation. The morning of the meeting, I took my time getting into work. I knew the presentation was scheduled for later in the afternoon, and I wanted to let the suspense build. By the time I got in, I noticed that Megan seemed almost giddy. She barely even noticed me as I walked past her, too busy reviewing her notes and shuffling her materials. She looked like she was gearing up for a Broadway performance. I settled in and went about my day, just waiting. When the time for the meeting finally rolled around, I made my way to the conference room and took a seat toward the back. Making sure I had a good view, I wanted to watch this unfold. See every reaction, every expression. The meeting began, and Megan launched into her presentation, on Oris with all the confidence of someone who'd spent weeks on it. She started flipping through the slides, explaining optimal revenue integration strategy, like she was unveiling the next big business breakthrough. I could hardly keep a straight face as she began throwing around all the buzzwords I planted, synergize, optimize, streamline, she hit every single one of them, like she'd memorized them from a corporate jargon dictionary. For the first few minutes, the boss looked intrigued, nodding along, seeming genuinely impressed, but as she moved to the next slide, filled with even more complex nonsense about revenue synergy optimization and cross-functional monetization streams, I saw his expression shift, his eyes narrowed, and I could tell he was trying to follow but hitting a mental wall. Megan kept going, oblivious to the mounting confusion in the room. She talked about preliminary success metrics and pointed at charts that looked meaningful but meant absolutely nothing. She'd even added a few of her own notes, clearly trying to flesh out the slides I'd left purposefully vague. I had to give her credit, she'd committed fully, running with Oris as if it were her magnum opus. Finally, our boss leaned forward, tilting his head as he squinted at the slide, and asked, Megan, this optimal revenue integration strategy, could you walk me through how exactly it applies to our current operations? I could see her eyes widen just a bit, the first sign of unease. She paused, clearly thrown off by the direct question. After a beat, she launched into a vague explanation about leveraging cross-functional platforms for maximized revenue. But she was starting to stumble, repeating phrases without actually answering the question. I could feel the tension rising as her confidence began to falter. The boss pressed on, this time asking for specifics on the revenue realization matrix slide. Megan's face turned a shade paler. She stammered, grasping at explanations that only dug her in deeper. She was running out of buzzwords, and she couldn't fake it anymore. It was as if the room was closing in on her, each question exposing the hollow presentation for what it was. And that's when the boss turned to me. You worked with Megan on this, didn't you? Could you clarify what she's trying to say here? I took a deep breath, pretending to consider the question carefully, and then gave a small shrug. Honestly, I'm not entirely sure what she's trying to convey. I'm as confused as you are. There was a pause, a heavy silence that seemed to settle over the entire room. Megan's eyes shot over to me, filled with a mix of shock and anger. Realizing she'd been caught without a lifeline, the boss gave her a hard look, clearly unimpressed, and I could practically see her mind racing, scrambling to come up with an explanation that just wasn't there. The meeting ended soon after, with the boss giving a curt nod and saying, let's revisit this when there's something concrete to discuss. Megan looked completely deflated, like someone had popped the balloon she'd floated in on. I watched as she gathered her materials, avoiding eye contact with everyone in the room. She knew she'd been exposed, and there was no covering it up. As I walked back to my desk. I felt a surge of satisfaction, like a weight had been lifted. She wanted credit for my work? Well, she'd just gotten it, just not in the way she'd expected. Sitting in that conference room, watching Megan's performance, I felt a strange mix of amusement and anticipation. She started off with her usual confidence, presenting optimal revenue integration strategy, like she was introducing the next big corporate innovation. Her voice was steady, and she didn't miss a beat, flipping through each slide as if she'd been studying it for weeks. And why wouldn't she? She thought she had a gold mine in her hands. The first few slides went by without a hitch. Megan was in her element, talking about revenue synergy and cross-functional monetization, each term rolling off her tongue like she'd invented them herself. She even threw in a few of her own improvisations, adding lines about maximizing our market impact through cohesive strategy alignment. She was completely in character, soaking up the attention as if she'd unlocked some secret to exponential growth. But then, about five slides in, I noticed our boss's expression shift from intrigued to puzzled, 
He leaned in, squinting at the screen, his brows pulling together as Megan clicked over to the infamous Revenue Realization Matrix slide. This one was my masterpiece, an elaborate chart filled with arrows pointing in random directions. Numbers that didn't add up, and labels that were, frankly, gibberish. I designed it to look impressive but utterly meaningless, knowing Megan would never dig deep enough to question it. The boss's face showed the first hint of skepticism. He cleared his throat, interrupting her mid-sentence. Megan, could you explain exactly how this revenue realization matrix is intended to work in our context? Megan froze for a split second, and I could see the wheels turning in her head. She glanced back at the screen, and for the first time, a little flicker of uncertainty crossed her face. But she quickly recovered, nodding enthusiastically as she launched into a roundabout explanation full of buzzwords. Well, you see, the matrix serves as a framework for aligning our core revenue generating initiatives with cross-functional teams thereby optimizing throughput. Her explanation sounded confident, but it was hollow, just words strung together, dancing around the fact that there was no real substance behind them. I watched as our boss's eyes narrowed further, and he asked a follow-up question, and how exactly would this align with our existing project timelines? I could see Megan's confidence beginning to waver. She stammered, glancing back at the screen as if it might somehow provide the answer she didn't have. Ah, uh, well, the timeline, it would be structured around strategic milestones, she said, struggling to keep her composure. Her voice was starting to shake, just a little, but enough for everyone to notice. She was floundering, and the room could feel it. And that's when our boss turned to me. You worked on this project with Megan, didn't you? Maybe you can shed some light on this. I could feel the tension in the room as every eye turned my way. I looked at the screen, then back at our boss, and gave a slight shrug. Honestly, I'm not sure what Megan's trying to convey here. I haven't heard of this optimal revenue integration strategy until now. Megan shot me a look, half disbelief, half horror. Her carefully crafted facade was cracking, and she knew it. The boss's face dropped as he looked back at Megan, clearly disappointed. The questions came at her fast after that, and it became painfully obvious that she couldn't keep up. Each time she tried to explain another slide, she dug herself deeper, contradicting her previous statements or repeating the same vague phrases without any real answers. By now, everyone in the room could see what was happening. Megan had tried to pass off something she didn't understand, and it was blowing up in her face. The boss didn't say anything outright, but his expression spoke volumes. This wasn't just a minor mistake, she'd effectively proven she had no grasp on her own project. The meeting wrapped up quickly after that. The boss gave her a curt nod and said, let's revisit this once we have a clearer direction, which was as close as he'd ever come to dismissing someone outright. Megan gathered her things in a rush, her face pale, avoiding eye contact with everyone in the room. She was trying to maintain her composure, but I could see the panic beneath the surface. She knew she'd been caught. As the team filed out, I stayed back, taking my time, feeling the weight of satisfaction settle over me. Megan had been exposed for what she was, a fraud who'd taken credit for other people's work one too many times. I'd given her exactly what she wanted, the spotlight, but this time, it had turned on her in a way she never saw coming. By the time I left the conference room, Megan was nowhere to be seen, she'd practically bolted out, no doubt feeling the sting of her own arrogance. And I, I finally felt free, I didn't have to worry about my work being hijacked or someone else taking credit. I'd taken back control, and it felt better than I could have imagined. Leaving that meeting felt like taking off a weight I'd carried for way too long. For months, I'd let Megan walk all over my work, take credit for everything I'd put my time and energy into, and finally, she'd been exposed. It wasn't just the satisfaction of watching her stumble through her presentation, it was that I'd finally done something about it. I'd shown everyone exactly who Megan was, without saying a single word. I went back to my desk, and the whole office was buzzing. I could hear whispers and see glances cast my way, a few raised eyebrows here and there. The story was already spreading. And I knew why, in a workplace where it was all too easy for people to overlook these things. The sight of Megan's usual self-assured attitude crumbling into stammered half-truths was something no one would forget. She'd managed to walk away from enough close calls, but this one had been too public, too undeniable. That afternoon, the boss stopped by my desk. He didn't say much, just a nod and a quick, good job on your recent projects. I'm looking forward to seeing more of your ideas. A simple statement, but the message was clear. For the first time, he saw me, the person actually behind the work he'd been praising Megan for, and it felt like validation, the kind I hadn't realized I'd been craving for so long. Megan, on the other hand, was nowhere to be found. Her desk was empty, her computer shut down, and her usual piles of paper and folders neatly stacked, like she'd left in a hurry. Rumor had it she'd taken the afternoon off, and I couldn't help but wonder how she felt sitting at home. Knowing she'd finally been outed, no amount of overconfidence could erase the memory of that meeting. The look on the boss's face or the whispers spreading through the office. The next day, Megan came back, but something had changed. She walked into the office with her head down, avoiding eye contact with just about everyone. It was a stark contrast to her usual grand entrances, where she'd make her rounds, stopping by to drop hints about her latest ideas or big plans. Now, she'd lost her spotlight, and it showed. 
I noticed she'd stopped lingering by my desk, stopped trying to check in on my projects, and didn't even attempt to pull the same stunts. It was like she'd finally realized that her free ride was over, and she was keeping her distance. Part of me wondered if she'd come up with a new way to claw her way back up. But something told me that this time was different. The embarrassment had left a mark on her, and she knew the trust of her co-workers, and, more importantly, the boss, was gone. For me, though, everything felt different. For once, people stopped by my desk to ask questions, to get my input on things they used to ask Megan about. I could feel the shift happening slowly, as people started recognizing me for the ideas and work that had once gone unnoticed. I wasn't just some guy in the background anymore, I was the person they knew could get things done. Who actually knew the work inside and out. And it wasn't about fame or praise, more than anything. It was about finally feeling like I belonged. Like my work mattered. Over the next few weeks, my standing in the office grew. I wasn't worried about someone stealing my work or wondering if my efforts would go unacknowledged. The team even started assigning more substantial projects to me directly, giving me chances to present my own work. Something that would have been unthinkable before. I felt confident. Like I could actually show up and be seen without someone stepping in to steal the credit. As for Megan, she faded further into the background. I still saw her around, of course. But she'd lost her bravado. Gone were the days of her strutting through the office like she ran the place. She kept her head down, sticking to her own work, and never again tried to swipe someone else's ideas. People still eyed her with a hint of suspicion, and she never quite regained the respect or trust she'd once commanded. It was like she'd become a ghost of her former self, her reputation now stained by the mess she'd created. I guess I'd learned something through all of this, too. For a long time, I thought I could just keep my head down and everything would work out eventually. But that day in the meeting taught me that sometimes, you have to stand up for yourself, even if it means taking a risk. It wasn't about revenge, it was about respect. The respect I deserved but hadn't been getting. In the end, I didn't need to humiliate Megan or call her out in front of everyone. She did that to herself. All because she couldn't resist grabbing what wasn't hers. And for the first time, I felt like I finally claimed my place. Not by playing games or seeking validation, but by quietly doing what I did best. I can't say I'll ever be grateful to Megan for all the grief she caused. But in a weird way, I'm glad it happened. She showed me that I had more power over my own work and my own reputation than I'd ever realized. The weeks that followed felt like a completely different world at work. It wasn't like I suddenly got promoted or anything flashy like that. But the little things started changing. The same co-workers who once overlooked me now came directly to my desk when they needed insights or input. They asked for my advice on projects, ran ideas by me, even invited me to brainstorming sessions where, before, they might have only looped in Megan. And the shift? It wasn't just about how they saw me, it was how I saw myself. Two, for the first time in ages, I felt like I belonged, like I'd earned my place here, and it felt damn good. I think what surprised me most was how natural it felt to finally step into my own role. Unencumbered by Megan's meddling, I'd always thought of myself as the, keep to myself, type. Someone who didn't need the spotlight or the accolades, but that wasn't exactly true. It turned out I did care about recognition, but in a quiet, steady way, I wanted my work to be valued, not for applause or ego but because I knew I was good at what I did. Now, for the first time, I was being recognized for it on my own terms. Megan, meanwhile, had faded into the background. She was still there, of course, always punctual, typing away at her desk. But she'd stopped with her usual theatrix. No more, accidentally, overhearing project plans. No more swooping in to offer her, unique perspective, on work that wasn't hers. Her influence had shrunk, and the team's trust in her was basically gone. She seemed to sense it too, keeping her head down and rarely making eye contact. I didn't revel in her discomfort, I think. At some point, I just stopped noticing her altogether. The ultimate test came a month later, when the team was assigned another big project, one even more challenging than the one Megan had tried to claim as hers. The boss called me into his office and asked if I'd be interested in taking the lead. He didn't mention Megan, didn't even hint at her, and for the first time, I felt like my own person, not someone's backup, not someone's support, but a genuine lead. As I worked on the new project, I felt more comfortable stepping up and actually owning my ideas. I no longer worried that someone was waiting in the wings ready to claim my work as their own. I could experiment, take risks, and push the limits without looking over my shoulder. That freedom was something I hadn't realized I'd been missing. But once I had it, I could never imagine going back. One afternoon, as I was wrapping up some notes on the project, Megan passed by my desk. She paused, gave a slight nod, and muttered a quick, good work on that last report. It wasn't an apology, and I didn't need it to be. Her acknowledgement, however small, was enough to close the chapter. I nodded back, thanked her, and we each returned to our own work. In that moment, it felt like the story was over, no bitterness, no lingering resentment, just a quiet understanding that we'd moved on. Looking back on everything, I realized that my experience with Megan had taught me something crucial. My worth didn't hinge on others' opinions or on some elusive credit that could be snatched away. It was about how I saw myself, the confidence I had in my work, and the boundaries I was willing to set.
I didn't need to be aggressive or loud to hold my ground, I just needed to believe in my own value enough to protect it. And as for the future, I could finally see it with a sense of pride and purpose. I wasn't the guy hiding in the shadows, hoping my work would speak for itself. I was the person standing tall, unafraid to let my work shine, trusting that it was good enough on its own. I didn't need Megan's approval or anyone else's to feel like I belonged. I was done doubting myself. And in the process, I'd earned the respect I'd been seeking all along. So here I am, no longer just a face in the office but someone who brings real value to the table. And I know now that I'll never let anyone take that away from me again. I Ada for refusing to let my parents live with me after they loaned me money to buy my house? Let me tell you, buying my first home was a huge moment for me. I'd been saving for years, years of scrimping, cutting corners, and saying no to things just to put away enough for a down payment. It was one of those things I'd been dreaming about since my early 20s. And when it finally happened, I felt this overwhelming sense of pride. My own place, a spot to call mine, free from leases, landlords, and the general lack of privacy that comes with apartment living. It wasn't some grand estate, but it was my little slice of the American dream. The down payment had taken almost every penny I'd saved. But luckily, my parents had come through in a big way. Out of the blue, they'd offered me $20. They called it a gift and told me they wanted to help me secure a place of my own. I remember feeling almost uncomfortable at first, $20 was a lot of money. And I wasn't sure about accepting it, but they insisted, it's a gift, they'd said, no strings attached, they knew how long I'd been saving, how hard I'd been working for this, and they just wanted to help make it happen, after a lot of back and forth, I accepted, I was deeply grateful, and I told them so, it meant a lot to me that they were willing to do that, when I got the keys, I invited my parents over to celebrate, they were thrilled, proud of me, and we spent the day going over every room, planning where I'd put my furniture, talking about my future, they even joked about how they'd raised a homeowner, it was like a small family celebration, a shared moment that, to me, symbolized how far I'd come, with them cheering me on every step of the way, I felt supported, loved, and like we were all on the same page, the whole experience felt like a memory I'd hold on to for years, a story I'd tell down the line about the time I bought my first home. So, there I was, a 29-year-old homeowner, doing my best to settle into this new chapter of my life. For a while, everything felt perfect, the house wasn't huge, but it was exactly what I needed, a place to make my own. To finally feel settled, I was beyond grateful for that $20 gift. I knew it made a big difference in getting me where I wanted to be. But, more than that, I was grateful for the way it felt like a family moment. Like we were all in this together. It made me feel close to them in a way I hadn't felt in a long time. In my mind, that money was a heartfelt gesture. One they'd given out of love. A family gift. Not some kind of financial transaction. That's how they'd framed it. And that's how I'd come to see it. No strings attached. No hidden expectations. Just family looking out for family. At least, that's what I thought. Little did I know, that gift would come back to haunt me. Fast forward a few months. I'd finally settled into the house. Put my mark on the place. I was feeling good about where things were heading. Comfortable in my routine, and happy with the life I was building for myself. Then, out of nowhere, my phone rings. It's my mom, which isn't unusual. But the tone of her voice was off, friendly. But with an edge I couldn't quite place. She starts off with small talk. Asking how the house is. How I'm managing, if I'm taking care of myself. And then, she drops it on me. So, she says casually, your father and I will be coming to stay with you for a while. Just until we get back on our feet. She said it in this breezy way. Like it was the most natural thing in the world. Like she'd told me they'd stop by for coffee. I was stunned. Moving in with me? That was the last thing I'd expected. There hadn't been a single conversation about it. No hint or warning. They'd never even asked if I'd be okay with it. They just decided. When I hesitated, I could feel her irritation through the phone. Like I was the one being unreasonable. Then she dropped the bombshell. Well, we gave you that $20, didn't we? She said. We thought it was only fair that you help us out now. There it was, plain as day. That gift I'd been so grateful for had somehow transformed into a debt. My dad had lost his job. My mom's part-time work wasn't cutting it. And now, according to them, it was time for me to repay the favor by letting them live with me. Indefinitely. I couldn't even process it all at once. Here I was, thinking that money was a gift. Something they'd offered out of generosity. Now they were calling it a loan? The terms had changed without me even knowing it, and it felt like I'd been blindsided. I was supposed to hand over my independence, my space, my sanity, as though I owed it to them. And when I didn't immediately agree, they acted like I was being selfish. She kept talking, but honestly, I barely heard her. I was stuck on that one word, loan. That had never once been mentioned. Not a single conversation, not a hint that they'd ever expect repayment, let alone a full-on living arrangement. But now, suddenly, I was obligated to open my doors because they'd invested in my home. They weren't asking me, they were telling me. The more I thought about it, the angrier I got. It wasn't just that they were asking for help, it was how they'd framed it. 
How they'd turned something that had once felt like a blessing into a trap. It was as if they'd pulled the rug out from under me. Revealing strings I never knew existed. But how was I supposed to say no? It was my parents. After all, family is family, right? Still, I couldn't just ignore how I felt. This was my home, my sanctuary, the one place I could finally call my own. And now they wanted to waltz in, set up shop, and change all of that? It didn't feel right. But the guilt? Oh, that was another story. Over the next few days, I tried to make sense of it all. But every time I thought about it, I just felt more confused, more hurt, and honestly, more trapped. It was like my parents had flipped a switch overnight, turning from supportive family to reluctant investors demanding their dues. Suddenly, that gift they'd given me came with fine print, a set of rules I'd never agreed to but was now expected to follow. And not just any rules, rules that essentially meant giving up my home, my peace of mind, and my privacy indefinitely. I decided I couldn't just go along with it, not without at least talking things through. So, I called my mom back and gently suggested that if they needed help, maybe we could work out a temporary plan. They could stay with me for a few weeks, or I could pitch in with some of their bills. I figured a compromise would keep the peace and maybe make them realize that I wasn't saying, no, to helping. I was just trying to protect the space I'd worked so hard for. But my suggestion didn't go over well. At all. My mom's tone turned icy. She said they weren't looking for temporary help, they were looking for a place to live. After all, she said, we helped you buy that house. It's only fair we get to stay in it if we need to. Her words hit me like a slap. The house that I dreamed of, saved for, and worked my tail off to afford, suddenly. It didn't feel like mine anymore. It felt like I'd been tricked into buying it for them. She went on to explain how they'd been there for me, every step of the way. And now it was my turn to return the favor. My turn to sacrifice, to show my gratitude, to do the, right thing. She reminded me of their, investment, in my future. Her words wrapped in a bitterness that was new to me. Like I was some kind of ungrateful child. But it wasn't just her words, it was what she was implying, that I owed them access to my life. My home, and apparently, my every decision. And my dad? He doubled down on it. He talked about converting my office into their bedroom. How they'd want to have a say in how things ran in the house, since they helped pay for it. He even said they'd need the master bedroom because they, needed space. Suggesting I could move to the smaller guest room. They weren't just asking for a place to stay, they were planning to take over. I sat there, holding the phone, feeling this tightness in my chest. They weren't interested in finding a temporary fix. They wanted control, ownership, and a place to live on their terms. The word, ungrateful, came up a lot during that conversation. Two, my dad threw it around freely, implying that after everything they'd done for me, this was how I repaid them. That a bit of inconvenience on my end was nothing compared to the sacrifices they'd made over the years. It felt like they were painting me as the villain for not immediately giving in to their demands. I felt torn to shreds inside, like a rope being pulled in two directions. On one hand, they were my parents, I loved them, I respected them, and I did feel a sense of obligation to help them, especially after everything they'd done to get me on my feet. But on the other hand, this was my life, this house was supposed to be my safe space, a place where I could breathe and not feel indebted to anyone. It was supposed to be a reward for all my hard work, a step toward building a life on my own terms. But now it felt like I was being robbed of that. I started to realize just how differently we saw things. To me, that $20 was a family gift. A helping hand so I could secure my future. To them, it was an investment in a shared asset. Something they felt entitled to influence, access, and ultimately use to their benefit. I had never agreed to that. I'd never signed up to give up my autonomy or have my home life dictated by someone else's agenda. But what was I supposed to do? If I said no, I'd be the ungrateful son who turned his back on his parents in their time of need. If I said yes, I'd be giving up my life, my space, and my peace indefinitely. It felt like no matter what I did, I'd lose. After that phone call, I knew I couldn't just ignore the situation and hope it would sort itself out. I had to find a way to help my parents without surrendering my home and peace. So I took a deep breath, gathered my thoughts, and called my mom back, determined to present a reasonable compromise that would help them without turning my life upside down. I started by telling her that I understood they were in a tough spot. And I wanted to support them however I could. I offered to cover some of their bills for a few months until things got more stable. Or maybe, I suggested, we could look into helping you find an affordable place nearby. I'd be happy to help with the rent for a while if you need it. The line went quiet for a second, and I thought maybe she was considering it. But then she let out a sharp sigh, like she was disappointed, and she told me, we don't need your money, we need a place to live. She brushed aside my suggestions as if they were insulting. It was as if helping with bills or rent wasn't good enough. She wanted the whole package, a permanent place in my life. My house, my privacy. I told her I just wasn't comfortable with an open ended stay. Especially since we'd never agreed on any sort of long term arrangement. But that didn't sit well with her. My mom acted like I was talking about some stranger moving in instead of my own parents. After everything we've done for you, 
she said, with this tone that dripped with disappointment. We're your family, and family takes care of each other. We thought you understood that. She didn't seem to understand that this was my sanctuary. This was supposed to be the one place where I didn't have to answer to anyone else. The place I could just be myself. Free from expectations or obligations. But according to her, none of that mattered because, to her, family obligations outweighed my need for privacy or independence. After a while, she put my dad on the phone, hoping he could convince me. He got straight to the point, saying that they didn't want to rent some apartment nearby. They wanted to live in the house they had helped me buy. They started framing it like a shared space, a joint investment, something they had a say in. He even implied that, since they'd helped pay for it, it wasn't just my house, it was as much theirs as it was mine. My compromise attempts went down like a lead balloon. They kept bringing the conversation back to that $20, insisting that they wouldn't even be in this position if they hadn't sacrificed that money to help me get started. It was like every suggestion I made bounced right off them, like they were set on this idea of moving in with me. No matter what I said, the worst part was when my dad dropped this little bombshell, if it wasn't for us. You'd never have that house in the first place. It was a low blow, one that made me feel small, like I hadn't earned my home or my independence on my own. It was a slap in the face, as if all the saving, the hard work, the budgeting meant nothing. In his mind, I was standing there on a foundation they'd built, and now I was being ungrateful for not letting them share it. And that's when I realized they didn't just want help, they felt entitled to my space, like they had a permanent claim on my life. They weren't looking for a temporary solution, they wanted to change the entire setup. To impose themselves in a way I couldn't escape from, I kept my tone as calm as I could, though every word felt heavier. Harder to say, I told them that, while I loved them and appreciated everything they'd done for me, I wasn't ready to give up my home indefinitely. I reiterated my willingness to help financially, to cover bills, or to find them a nearby apartment that I'd gladly help fund. But I couldn't let them stay in my home without an end date in sight. My dad just sighed, this long, exasperated sound, like he was speaking to a child who just didn't get it. We're family, and family doesn't turn their back, he said, his voice edged with finality. This isn't about money, it's about what's right. I hung up feeling like I'd failed them, like I was some kind of selfish jerk for wanting my own space, for needing boundaries, but the more I thought about it, the more I knew I'd done everything I could, I'd offered a compromise, tried to be there for them, and made it clear that I wanted to help, but their response told me one thing, it was either their way or no way. Not long after that call with my parents, the phone started lighting up with texts and missed calls from family members. Word had spread, quickly, and somehow, it seemed that everyone in the extended family had been briefed on the situation. Apparently. My parents had painted a picture where I was refusing to repay them for their generosity. Turning my back on family when they needed me most. My aunt was the first to reach out. Her message was a passive-aggressive masterpiece. Family's everything. Sweetheart, remember who's been there for you all these years. Then came my cousin, who hadn't spoken to me in months but felt compelled to weigh in now. We were shocked to hear you'd turn your parents away. They helped you so much with that house. I could practically hear the disappointment in his voice. Even through text. It was as if they'd all been given the same script. No one seemed interested in my side of the story. They saw me as the ungrateful son who was selfishly guarding his precious space while his parents struggled. It hurt, deeply, because I knew they didn't understand. They weren't in my shoes. Hearing the way my parents had twisted things, the entitlement, the lack of boundaries, they weren't the ones being asked to give up their home indefinitely. But the kicker was a call from my mom's sister. She laid it on thick, reminding me of all the times my parents had sacrificed for me. You know. She said, her voice dripping with that particular mix of disappointment and righteousness. Your parents gave up so much to help you get started. I remember them bragging about you when you bought that house. They were so proud. And this is how you thanked them. She didn't even ask about my perspective. She didn't want to know. To her, it was cut and dry. They helped me. And now I was abandoning them. The guilt started creeping in. It was almost impossible not to feel it. These were my parents. After all, they'd done a lot for me. And family loyalty was something I'd always valued. I'd grown up being told that family came first. That you never turn your back on the people who raised you. And here I was, questioning if I was being a horrible son for even wanting my own space. I kept asking myself, was I being unreasonable? Was I letting them down? But every time I started to waver, I thought about what moving in would actually mean. I imagined the daily intrusion, the lack of boundaries, the way they'd talk about having a say in my home, my dad expecting to use my office, my mom assuming they'd get the master bedroom, both of them wanting a say in household decisions. This wasn't just about temporary help. It was about losing control of the life I'd worked so hard to build. And that realization brought me back, gave me the strength to hold my ground, even as the guilt weighed on me. One evening, after a particularly heated conversation with my uncle, who all but accused me of forgetting where I came from, I took a step back to reflect. I reminded myself that I wasn't saying no to family. I'd offered to help with bills, suggested covering their rent, and had made it clear I'd be there for them in any way I could. 
just not by giving up my home indefinitely. The more I thought about it, the more I realized that setting boundaries didn't make me a bad person. It just meant I was choosing to protect the life I'd worked for. Even if it meant facing backlash. My mom and dad continued to call, alternating between guilt trips and subtle threats, implying they'd be forced to tell more family members if I didn't reconsider. They made it seem like I was letting everyone down, tarnishing the family's name by refusing their reasonable request. It was exhausting. They kept saying, you know everyone thinks you're making a mistake, right? And with each call, they chipped away at me, hoping I'd cave. But what they didn't understand was that every guilt trip, every family member's call, every accusation only made me more determined. I was beginning to see that this wasn't just about them needing help, it was about control. They wanted to dictate my life, my choices, and my home because they'd given me that $20. They didn't want gratitude, they wanted ownership. So, I decided that I wouldn't engage anymore. I stopped explaining myself to relatives who didn't want to understand, stopped defending my decision to people who hadn't even asked about my side. I realized that if they couldn't see where I was coming from, if they didn't value my boundaries, then they didn't really understand what family should be about. And while I'd be lying if I said it didn't sting to feel isolated, I knew I was doing the right thing. The fallout with my family hurt, but the thought of losing my home, my sanctuary, hurt even more. For the first time, I understood that sometimes, standing up for yourself means disappointing people, even the ones you love, and maybe that's okay. A few days after the family backlash started, I got another call from my dad. This one wasn't friendly or subtle, it was sharp and to the point. We need to talk, he said, and I could tell by his tone that he wasn't interested in hearing anything new from me he was calling to deliver an ultimatum. When we finally spoke, he laid it out, if you don't let us move in, I'm taking you to court over that $20. It was an investment, not a gift, and if you're not willing to repay us by letting us stay, then I want my money back. His words hit me like a brick. Court? My own dad was threatening legal action, all because I didn't want to hand over my home. This was beyond anything I'd expected. I kept my cool, even though my heart was pounding. I asked him why he'd ever called it a gift in the first place if he'd planned to hold it over me like this. He didn't have an answer. Instead, he doubled down, claiming that I misunderstood the situation. That I should have known family support comes with responsibilities. But there was no misunderstanding. They had called it a gift. And now, because it suited them, they were flipping the script. I reminded him that I'd offered to help with bills, pay rent on an apartment for them, even cover other expenses if they needed. But nothing was good enough because it wasn't what they wanted. They wanted my home. And for the first time, I understood fully that this wasn't about need, it was about control. They were trying to hold my life, my peace, and my stability hostage over money they'd given willingly. Family helps family, he kept saying, each time more forcefully, as if repeating it enough would break me down. We sacrificed for you, now it's your turn to sacrifice for us. He even threw in how they were disappointed in the man I'd become. That they thought they'd raised me to be more grateful. I took a deep breath, knowing that this was the moment I had to stand firm. I'm not letting you move in, I said, my voice steadier than I felt. I offered to help, I offered alternatives, but my home is not an option. If you want to take me to court, fine, but don't expect me to feel guilty for protecting my boundaries. The line went silent, my dad was stunned, I'd never spoken back to him like that before, and I think he thought he'd intimidated me into backing down, but I wasn't about to be bullied out of my own space. When he finally spoke again, he was furious, he accused me of being selfish, of forgetting where I came from. If you turn your back on us now, don't expect us to be there for you when you need family. He said, throwing every last bit of guilt and manipulation he could muster. But I made up my mind. I told him calmly that I hoped things would work out for them. That I still loved them, but that this was my final decision. They could either accept my offer of financial help and support or go through with their court threat. But either way, I was keeping my house as my own. We ended the call, and I was left sitting in silence, feeling a mix of relief and sorrow. I knew I'd crossed a line, one that I couldn't uncross. I'd chosen myself, my peace, my future over their demands and as much as it felt like the right thing to do, it still hurt. Standing my ground had cost me, and I wasn't sure if I'd lost my parents for good. Over the next few days, the silence was deafening. My phone didn't ring, no calls, no texts, nothing from my parents or any of the extended family who'd been so vocal before. It felt like I'd been cast out, left to deal with the consequences of choosing my own boundaries over family expectations. Part of me wondered if I'd done the wrong thing, if maybe I should have just agreed to let them stay to keep the peace. But each time those thoughts crept in, I reminded myself of the sacrifice I'd already made to buy this house, of the independence I'd fought so hard to earn. And I realized that standing up for myself wasn't selfish, it was necessary. I couldn't live my life constantly bending to the will of others. Even if they were family. If that meant going through the awkward, painful fallout, then so be it. I was done letting guilt dictate my choices. Eventually, I heard back from my dad through a curt text. We'll figure something else out. It read, as if that was all there was to say. No apology. 
No acknowledgement of their manipulation. Just a cold message that felt like a door closing. And honestly, I think it was. They didn't get what they wanted, so they were washing their hands of me. Maybe thinking I'd come crawling back someday. But I'd already made my peace with it. I wasn't the same person I'd been before all this started. I'd found my voice. Found the strength to stand up for myself and hold firm. Even when it meant facing the anger and disappointment of the people I loved most. In the end, I knew I'd done the right thing. I'd chosen myself. And that was something I wasn't willing to regret. If they couldn't see that. Then maybe. Just maybe. It wasn't about me at all. After that final message from my dad. I expected to feel some kind of relief. Like the dust had finally settled. And in a way. I did. But there was also this hollow ache. A sadness I couldn't shake off. I knew I'd made the right decision. But that didn't mean it hadn't come at a cost. My parents had gone silent. The calls and texts from family members had stopped. And it felt like I'd been dropped from everyone's radar. It was as if they'd closed ranks. Shutting me out because I hadn't fallen in line. The house felt emptier now. Quieter. I'd wanted this space. Fought hard for it. And here I was. Finally alone with it. I'd done all of this for peace. For independence. For the chance to live on my own terms. But standing up for that had created a rift I wasn't sure would ever heal. It was like I'd become a stranger to my own family. I kept replaying the events in my mind. Wondering if there'd been a way to make them see things from my perspective. But every time I went down that path. I remembered how they'd made me feel. Manipulated. Pressured. Backed into a corner. I began to realize that the peace I felt in my home now was worth more than all the forced apologies and guilty compromises I could have offered them. This space was mine again. Truly mine. And it felt like a victory. Albeit a bittersweet one. I didn't have to worry about someone else taking over my rooms. Questioning my decisions. Or dangling their investment over my head. I could breathe freely here. And each breath reminded me that I'd made the right choice. No matter the fallout. A few weeks later. I ran into my aunt at the grocery store. She gave me a look that said more than words ever kid. A mixture of disappointment and pity. Like she was seeing me through a new. Judgmental lens. She asked how I was doing. And though I could sense she didn't really want to know. I told her the truth. I'm doing okay. I said. And left it at that. She looked at me as if I confirmed her worst suspicions. And I knew she'd already made up her mind about me. It hurt. Knowing I was now the. Black sheep. But I wasn't about to explain myself again. As the weeks turned into months. The silence from my parents lingered. There were days I almost called them. Ready to bridge the gap. Maybe to apologize even if I wasn't exactly sure what for. But each time. Something held me back. Maybe it was pride. Maybe it was the lingering resentment. Or maybe it was the fear that by reaching out. I'd be setting myself up for another round of guilt and manipulation. I just wasn't ready to open that door again. In the meantime. Life went on. I poured my energy into my work. Into the little projects around the house I'd always wanted to tackle. I made new memories in my home. Began to see it as a place of comfort again. Not a battleground for family expectations. I realized that this experience had shifted something inside me. I felt a new kind of strength. A quiet but steady resolve to protect my boundaries. For the first time, I put myself first. And while it was painful, it felt like a necessary step toward becoming the person I wanted to be. One evening, as I was sitting on my back porch, I got a text from my mom. It was short, just a few words, hope you're well, there was no accusation, no mention of the past few months, just a simple, neutral message, I stared at it for a while, unsure how to respond, it wasn't quite an olive branch, but it wasn't a closed door, either, I typed back a quick, thanks, you too, and left it at that, it dawned on me that the relationship with my parents might never go back to the way it was, there'd always be this unspoken tension, this knowledge of the boundaries I'd set and the fallout that followed, but maybe that was okay. Maybe we could find a new way of relating. One that respected my independence. Even if it meant things would be different. In the quiet that settled after that exchange. I felt something shift. It wasn't a grand resolution. But a soft acceptance. A gentle letting go. I'd chosen myself. And it had cost me. But I also knew that this choice had opened a door to a new kind of freedom. One where I could set my own terms and live my own life. Even if it meant redefining what family looked like. I realized that boundaries weren't just about keeping others out. They were also about letting myself in. Into a life I'd worked hard for. Into a future I could shape on my own terms. Without bending to the weight of someone else's demands. And for the first time. I felt truly at peace in my home. Knowing that this was where I belonged. Just as I was. Unencumbered and free.